anybody, uh, everybody hear me again? Uh, yes. That's good. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's a bit tricky with all this technical setup when we have to do everything remote. Um, yeah, before I begin on the presentation, I just want to let everybody know that I have both shared the screen uh, of my slides because the video feed on this remote teaching setup is not the best. So if you want to see more details in the images that I present, then I suggest that you also use the uh, GCF screen uh, in your picture. Uh, and then you can of course follow along on the video feed as well. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to my, uh, uh, my D PhD defense. Um, since we are due to the circumstances with the coronavirus, we are not allowed to have people physically present here at the AU premise. So it's nice to see that there are so many people uh, joining us on Zoom instead. At least I can see that there uh, are a lot, lot of people checking in and they're continuously getting logging more online. Um, in this presentation, I'll go through the content of my PhD thesis, which is uh, titled Advancing Visual Recognition of Plant Seedlings Through Generative Modeling and Data Collection. I'll start out with a small uh, introduction or motivation for why this work is important. In uh, agricultural farming, there is a, always an issue with weeds in a field because weeds are uh, competing with the resources in the ground uh, with the crops. So if there is a lot of field or if there is a lot of weeds in the field, then we will get a lower crop yield from this field. So ideally what we would like to do is to either remove these weeds by killing them or at least uh, damage them so much that they don't compete with the crops about the weeds. How that's commonly done today is that we use chemical herbicides that is usually sprayed in a uniform pattern uh, across the entire field. However, uh, this approach is probably not the most optimal because if we take a look at how the weeds are actually distributed inside the field, we can see that there is a huge uh, difference in where the weeds are actually located. For example, this example here shows the distribution of monocots uh, in this particular field where we see that there is a huge uh, uh, density of weeds in the northern part of the map, uh, map north is to the left here, and in the middle of the field there's almost no weeds at all. So what we ideally would like to do is to only spray where the weeds are actually present and not where there aren't any weeds. And that might look something like this, uh, which is a spraying map that has been extracted by uh, making a threshold of uh, where there is more than two plants, observed more than two plants per square meter. This illustrates that it is also possible for us to save a lot of the herbicides by, because we do not need to spray in sort of half of this field. This is the uh, general idea behind the Rubble Weed Maps research project, which my PhD has been a part of. Um, and this Rubble Weed Maps project is a collaboration between uh, Aarhus University and pri uh, several private companies. The figure here illustrates the general idea behind the project, where we first have some uh, data collection in the field, where we either use airborne drones handheld cameras, or even today we also use land-based vehicles such as ATVs where we have mounted a camera upon, or we could also mount the camera directly on the farming equipment. These collected images are then being analyzed using uh, some computer algorithms, namely machine learning algorithms, that detect whether or not there are weed, weeds present in the field, or, and additionally, tries to classify these weeds into the specific species, because different weed species need to be treated differently. Based on the detections and classifications, we can then compute a spraying plan that we can send out into the sprayer, so that we sp spray with the correct dosage to kill the observed weeds at the correct locations, and with the correct herbicides to kill the weeds most efficiently. 
However, there are some challenges in this uh, setup, especially when it comes to the visual recognition systems, where we are currently only able to distinguish between a small subset of weed species, and that is primarily because weeds are highly similar, especially at the early development stages. And weeds also, uh, or plants in general, tend to have a high degree of variance with respect to the visual appearance based on in which condition they have grown. So for example, if we had observed a specific weed species down here in the, the field there in the bottom, it might look in, entirely different from the same weed species observed in another field. And that is one of the, some of the diff, uh, challenges that we have. So how do we overcome this issue? Uh, yeah. My PhD, PhD has been about how do, can we overcome this issue, and one way to do this is to increase the amount of data that we have for training our visual recognition systems. And in my PhD, I have explored two different approaches for this. The first one is generative modeling, where we use a creator model that learns from real data samples to be able to produce artificial samples of uh, plant seedlings. And the second approach is to uh, uh, develop a new uh, data set for visual recognition of plant seedlings. I'll start out by talking about the first approach, generative modeling of plant seedlings. For those of you that don't know what a generative model is, it's a model that we uh, train with a set of real images so that it learns properties from these uh, data so it's able to produce artificial samples that mimic properties of real data. These uh, samples should ideally uh, have a very high degree of realism for, to be able to be used in a data augmentation setup. Um, however, these samples should not simply be direct copies of the real data because then they do not contribute with any additional information when we have to train our visual recognition system. Um, additionally, the samples should not simply be the same uh, copies of the same highly plausible samples over and over again, because then again it doesn't in introduce any new information when we have to train our classification models. So instead, the samples should ideally uh, exhibit a very high degree of variation with respect to the visual uh, appearances. In my work, I have primarily worked with a, a generative model that is uh, called uh, Generative Adversarial Networks. This is a relatively new generative approach that was first introduced by Ian Goodfellow back in 2014. Uh, the model, uh, oh, these type of models formulates the generative process as a game between two players, the discriminator model and the generator model where the job of the discriminator is to, to, de to determine whether or not a given sample comes from the real data distribution, that is x, or the artificial data distribution x hat, uh, where the artificial data distribution is then generated by the generator, and the job of the generator is to make samples that are so as realistic as possible in an, in a to try to fool the discriminator into misclassifying them as being real. So these two networks continuously improve on their respective tasks so that we in the end prob uh, like, will likely get samples that are uh, generated samples that are indistinguishable from real data samples. I've tried to illustrate this in this small animation. In the initial training phases, the if we present some real images to the discriminator, the discriminator should ideally be able to uh, correctly classify these as belonging to the real data distribution. Whereas in the start, the generator had no idea what uh, real data looks like, so it might not just produce noise images, in which case the discriminator will have no it trouble uh, rejecting these samples as belonging to the generated data distribution. The generator then needs to update its models, its model, so it produces more plausible samples or more realistic samples. So, for example, these images here, and in this case, it might affect. In this instance, it might effectively fool the discriminator into believing these to be real 
The discriminator then needs to update its weights again, so it correctly rejects these samples as they are still not perfect when they com it compares it to the real data samples, which it still should be able to correctly classify as belonging to the real distribution. This battle goes back and forth until uh, the generator starts producing images that are indistinguishable from the real data samples, in which case the discriminator can no longer tell whether or not the any of the images belongs to the real or the artificial data distribution. In my work, I have tried to use these, uh, these scan models to create some artificial samples uh, of plant seedlings from multiple different plant species. Since we are going to try to model multiple plant species, we want the model to be able to create distinct samples for each of the individual species that I try to model. And additionally, I would like the sample to still uh, exhibit a high degree of variability within the species for each species, you know, within the samples for each species. This can, however, be highly challenging in the domain of plants, as plants naturally exhibit a very low degree of intraspecies variability. So, for example, this image here illustrates uh, five samples for. Uh, nine different, uh, uh, different species, <coughs> and in my opinion, it can be very hard to distinguish between some the different samples here because at this very early development stage, they are highly similar to each other. Additionally, the uh, uh, plants can also exhibit a very high degree of intraspecies variability as the plants uh, change their appearance a lot as they grow and become bigger. To handle this, uh, I need a model that is, uh, yeah, to handle this, I need to have uh, extended the model, so it, it includes an additional supervised conditioning on the GAN model, which relates to the classes that are labeled in the real data. Um, this model has been extended so that I include an additional input. Whoop. I don't know what happened there. Just give me a second. It's because this is a touch screen, so I need to zoom out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I've included a, an additional input for the generator model that is related to the class labels of the real data. And additionally, there's added an additional classification branch on the output side of the discriminator model. What this does is that we want to. Yeah, I'm just going to. That's broken a bit more than I see here. Here we go. Yeah. What this does is that we want to make sure that, that we have information preservation through the network so that when we put in a class encoding on the input side of the generator, the generator is then responsible for preserving this information in the generated sample so that the discriminator is again able to recognize the same uh, the class encoding on the output side. So this enables us to make, ideally enables us to make distinguishable samples for each of the different species that we want to re reproduce. This model is a combination of two existing GAN models, that is the AC GAN model and the Wasserstein GAN model with gradient penalty. These are some of the examples that the model is able to generate. Each of these images, uh, the switches between, represent a different species, whereas the images to the left represent real data samples, and the images to the right represent artificial data samples. And what this illustration show is that there seem to be a relatively good correspondence with the visual appearances from the between the class that it is. The, artificial samples is intended to represent and the, how actually plants look like. Another observation that is important to see here is that also that there it seemed to be a very high degree of variability within the samples that are generated for each of these different species. This is of course only a sm very small subset of the images that the model is uh, able to reproduce and also only a subset of the real data samples. However, there are still some errors in the data. For example, this image up here uh, in the top right, uh, 
you might be able to see that there are some image artifacts uh, in the images, which is probably uh, relate, uh, related to the net applied network architecture in the generator model that I, uh, or generator network that I've used. If we take a closer look at the SINAR species, we can also, uh, because this uh, samples illustrate some other issues with the model, is that these artificial samples seem to be missing stem, the stem in most of the samples, which is present in the real data samples. And that is probably also related to the applied GAN or the applied uh, architecture, network architecture in the generator. Another, some other issues we can observe from these examples specifically is that this model or this sample down here, uh, there seem to be a distortion in the leaves, and thereby the, uh, this sample is a poor representation of plants and gen or plant seedlings in general. And the sample here in the middle is a is a poor seem to me at least to be a poor representation of the Sinar species compared to what the real images look like. To evaluate whether or not the generated sample actually uh, actually looks like the species they are intended to represent, these samples have also been analyzed by using an external classification model that uh, was specialized to plant seedling classification of these exact species that I want to generate. By doing this, we can uh, get a measure for how often does the artificial species get recognized as the intended species which is known as the recognition accuracy. Um, and this table here shows the results. And what's important to note here is that the samples see generally seem to have a good correspondence, with, or seem to be recognized as the species they are intended to represent in the majority of cases. So we, in this case, we correctly recognize the species in, 50, in average in 59% of the cases. We can also plot these results in a confusion matrix that again show that there seem to be a good correspondence between the uh, intended species that the samples are uh, yeah, intended to represent and the species they are getting rec recognized as by the external classifier. However, there are some misclassifications of, in, that we can observe from this confusion matrix and that is, for example, that the Seal species tend to get misclassified as beaver, uh, and vice versa. Uh, and that is probably because these two species are uh, highly similar at the early development stages. Additionally, the stemic, it's, the model seemed to have overfitted slightly toward the stemic class, as, the, uh, as a lot of the different samples tend to get look as the stemic class. And that is probably because the STEM class is also the highest represented class in the training data that I have used. I have also tried to analyze whether or not there are some modalities or structures in the underlying uh, noise space that we use for generating these artificial samples. One way to do that is to do interpolation anal analysis where we draw out two random points in the noise space and interpolate between these two points to see if a transition in the noise space corresponds to an interpretable change in the visual appearance of the samples. One such uh, interpolation could look something like, uh, looks like this, where the, uh, it seems that there are interpolation in the noise space that corresponds to a size change in the samples that I'm generating. Uh, what's important to note here is that, that it seems that this uh, transition in the noise space seemed to correspond to a similar trend independent of the uh, species that I'm generating because each of these columns in this plot are generated using the same noise vector whereas uh, each row, the only thing that changes is the, for each row is the class encoding itself. This illustrates that we have successfully been able to extract or separate the modality that is the species encoding into the uh, supervised learning brands that we have used and make, uh, thereby also make distinct samples for each of the uh, different species. However, one thing to note when we do these, uh, this uh, noise space analysis is that these uh, interpolations are highly entangled, or these 
modalities are, seem to be highly entangled into each other, so when we retrain the model, this specific interpolation might not give the same results uh, in the new model. Um, so I've tried to extend the model to see if it is possible to capture these modalities in a new set of latent variables so that uh, we are actually able to control the appearance of the samples that we generate. And I've done that by making an additional uh, uh, extension of the model where I've added a new super and an unsupervised conditioning to the model, which again is simply implemented as an additional input to the generator model and an additional classification to the output model. What does this again? This again simply, what we simply want to achieve here again is that we want to make sure that we have information preservation through the network so that U passed through G. Uh, when we input U to the, at the input side of G, G is able to produce a sample from which D is again able to recognize the value of U. And this should ideally capture these dominating modalities in the data. Which modalities that we capture depends heavily on the form that we chose for our uh, latent variable U. So for example, if we were looking for a categorical uh, modality in the data, that could for example be leaf count, then we should probably choose a categorical variable, a random variable for U. And if we were looking for a linear trend in, uh, or modality, we would probably use a continuous uh, variable for U. Um, this model is again com a combination of uh, previous scan models. And these are the samples that we are able to generate with the new GAN model. It's the one that you see far furthest to the right. And in my personal opinion, I think the samples for the back GAN model seem to be uh, slightly better than the uh, models from, uh, samples from the back GAN model since the back-end info model seemed to be better at reproducing small objects such as the stem in the samples um, and they generally seem to be less noise in the images when I've looked at them uh, visually. Yes, and again we have also tried to use these analyze these samples using an external classification model and here we see that the recognition accuracy of these samples has increased by approximately 4 points. However, this uh, increase in recognition accuracy is not statistically uh, significant. So we can really say whether or not the, the backend info samples are better than the backend samples from this analysis. Um, again, we can plot the result in a confusion matrix, but uh, and it generally shows the same trend as uh, previously, where we have uh, Cial and Beaver getting misclassified, and again, it seems we have an overfit towards STEM and among other things. To see if we have successfully been able to uh, extract these modalities into the new latent variables, we have been, I have in my experiments used a two-dimensional latent variable for you that we have drawn from a continuous uniform distribution. So in this case, we look for a, a linear trend in the uh, linear modalities in the data. And if we visualize this in a 2D plot, we can get, a, we get, show, yeah, we get the following samples. In this case, we have used a fixed uh, noise vector uh, for set, and uh, this image only shows the examples for a single species, but we observed a similar trend for the other species with a very few uh, exceptions. Uh, some observation that we can do from this point is that it seems that we have successfully captured a size change modality in the, uh, the U1 variable, as the samples to the furthest to the left generally seem to be larger than the samples furthest to the right. And we have also successfully captured uh, a rotation modality in the uh, U2 variable as the samples uh, in the bottom seem generally to be oriented vertically, whereas they rotate slightly as they move towards the top where they are mostly oriented uh, horizontally with respect to the primary axis of the, uh, of the plant seedling. 
One can then discuss whether or not this rotation is an important parameter to model in the samples, but it does show that we are able to capture this modality and control it uh, doing this. Yes. Then I will go on with my, the second part of my PhD, and that is building a plant seedling data set for visual recognition of uh, yeah, plant seedlings. Um, today, how we are making a data collection in the Rubo Weed Maps project is that we either go out into the field to collect images with the airborne drones or the motorized vehicle, uh, the ATV, in this case. Uh, this form of data acquisition is highly beneficial because uh, when we do in uh, real-world data acquisition, the, plants, uh, uh, the appearance of the plants become as natural as possible. However, uh, and we do get a very high degree of variability when we collect images from uh, several different fields. However, uh, in, there are some issues with this real-world data uh, collection, and that is that the annotation of these images are very tedious and time-consuming because we will manually have to uh, go through a lot of these to detect whether or not there are weeds present in the images, which can be challenging as uh, we both have weeds and crops in the images, and these often overlap with each other. Additionally, a colleague of mine has shown that when we are uh, classifying these detected weeds directly from the images, it uh, is often prone to error, uh, even if we have expert annotators uh, uh, annotating the plant species. Another issue is that we often tend to get an underrepresentation of certain species, especially if they are naturally rare, due to the fact that some species occur more frequently than others. And finally, it is impossible for us to do tracking of the plant development when we are doing uh, real-world data acquisition. Mostly because uh, whenever we have done data collection, the farmer tends to spray his field afterwards, thereby killing off all the weeds. So we cannot track them afterwards. And even if he didn't do that, it would be near impossible for us to find the exact, uh, take images at the exact same locations each time. Uh, without uh, a significant drop in our, the capacity of our system. To overcome these issues, what I've done in my PhD is to build a stationary data acquisition platform that collects images of cultivated weeds at uh, Research Center Flagebia, which specializes in cultivating weeds as they uh, also do, uh, perform rec uh, recommendations for the herbicides which herbicides to use in Danish agriculture. And the setup is visualized over here to the right in the sketch, where we have a flood tray table in which we have placed some growth boxes uh, in which we plant the individual weed species in the separate uh, boxes. The set acquisition system is uh, this camera that is uh, mounted on a dolly in a railing system that then can traverse the uh, growth boxes and uh, take top-down uh, images of the uh, plants that are being cultivated. So we get a similar setup to the uh, ATP and drone images that we have out in the real world. The benefit of this system is that we are able to track the development of the plants uh, yeah, over time as we simply just need to do data collection multiple days in a row, and thereby we model a very high degree of intra-species variability as we watch the uh, plants grow. But additionally, we can also induce uh, variability within each of the uh, different species by applying multiple different growth conditions which affect the visual appearance as well. And uh, finally, the, data, uh, the annotation process becomes a lot simpler in this case because if we simply just plant a single species for each of the growth boxes, we just need to identify which box this image represents, and then the majority, at least the majority of the species in this box correspond to the species that we have. 
that can, of course, occur weeds in the cultivated weeds. This is the uh, set, uh, final setup that we have implemented. Um, the, you can here see the flux ray tables with the, uh, with the uh, polystyrene growth boxes placed on top. Um, the wooden beams here are the supporting structure for the uh, camera setup. And you might be able to see the alumina rating system with the camera mounted uh, on a dolly here in the uh, yeah, right middle of the image. The data acquisition is simply performed by dragging the camera assembly along in the length of the tables. And it has an automated trigger based on the distance sensor to trigger when to uh, capture the images. What's important to note about this system is that it has a very short uh, exposure time or it has been configured to have a very short exposure time so that we minimize the amount of natural light that we get in the images. Additionally, we use a ring flash setup so that we uh, reduce the amount of shadows that the flash is uh, producing in the images. So ideally, we should get images that has no shadows and uh, almost uh, due to uh, natural light and no shadows because we use a ring uh, from, the from the flash due to the ring flash uh, configuration. The collected images look like this, and here you will probably need to uh, look at the shared slides to get a good impression of the quality, because even this projector here is not a good representation. Uh, what this image, show, image shows is that we get a very high ground, res relatively high ground resolution that is able to capture even small structural details in the images because this scale down here that you can see is only four centimeters. So a lot of these plants are uh, below uh, one centimeter in, uh, in, in their size or diameter. Uh, additionally, you can also see that there are no shadows in this image because, again, due to the ring flash setup, that ensures that the shadows are always underneath the plants themselves. Um, to induce uh, intraspecies variability in the samples, we have applied different growth conditions to each of the different species. And in, the set, in our experiments, we have uh, used three different growth conditions, which is visualized in this uh, uh, illustration here. Uh, the uh, growth condition one is sort of the optimal growth condition where the plants grow really fast and become big uh, relatively quickly compared to the other two growth conditions. Growth condition number two is sort of an, the worst growth condition that we can apply because here the plants are experimenting, experiencing drought stress which uh, makes the plant very uh, brown, makes the plants brown in their colors and yellow and reddish. And in the end, they actually start uh, wrinkling in on themselves, so they don't grow very well. And the last growth condition is sort of an uh, in-between uh, of the two, where uh, that is uh, probably the one that is uh, closest to what we experience in the real world. Uh, this shows that we, the plant appearances depend a lot on the growth condition. It's simply just an illustration that the appearance of the plants depend a lot on the growth conditions. Finally, the data has been annotated using the uh, RoboWeedMaps online annotation tool, where that provides a machine learning assisted framework for doing bounding box annotation of individual plants. Um, and this has made the annotation process relatively easy because uh, uh, here we just need to validate whether or not these uh, bounding box annotation is correct and if they were uh, region proposals was correct. If, uh, if there were some incorrect uh, region proposals, the annotator could just delete the bounding boxes and manually draw in a new annotation for the plants that were incorrectly uh, uh, yeah, captured. The tool also allowed us to uh, group these uh, individual, or visualize the individual plants that were in these bounding boxes in a group view so that we were easily able to annotate the species of the individual uh, bounding boxes. Uh, and since 
we simply just needed to identify, due to the uh, labeling on the boxes, we simply just, we were able to know the species of the plants inside the specific box, so the annotator could simply just take the majority of the species uh, plants and assign uh, the most frequently occurring plant in this image and assign that to the specific species it belongs to. By having this group overview, you could also identify the outliers and reassign those to uh, a different species. Um, yeah, and then I, to summarize the con final content of this data set, the data set consists currently of 47 different plant species that were cultivated using these three unique uh, growth conditions in order to, uh, that were all cultivated using these three different growth conditions in order to induce a high degree of variability within each of the species. The data set consists of two primary parts, that is uh, full box images, that is uh, images of these uh, growth boxes with the bounding box annotations for each of the individual plant instances in the image. And the second part is individual crop out plant objects uh, that of course has been annotated with, uh, with species for each of these. In total, there are uh, approximately 7,600 uh, full box images with annotated uh, plants or bounding box location for the uh, plant objects. And in total, there are 300, approximately 300,000 individual plant objects uh, in this data set. And with these numbers, the data set is, to my knowledge, by far the largest pop, uh, publicly available data set that is out there of plant seedlings. And you will be able to download the entire data set at the following uh, uh, web address. The data set also includes uh, two different baseline experiments that was used to introduce uh, potential uh, applications of this data. Uh, the, I have not focused on making uh, some exceptional results on this baseline as they were just used to introduce uh, different uh, evaluation metrics uh, or, and uh, highlight the applications of the, uh, some applications of the data. The first uh, baseline experiment was a plant instance detection uh, experiment where we wanted to detect the individual plant instance, uh, instances in uh, the full box images. And to do this, we simply just used an out of the box uh, TensorFlow implementation of faster RCNN. And uh, the table here in the bottom shows the baseline results for that. Uh, yeah, I won't go into details with them. And the second uh, baseline experiment was the uh, plant species classification task where we wanted to classify the species of the individual plant cutouts. And again, we just used a, uh, a TensorFlow implementation uh, uh, of ResNet uh, 50 in this case, and to produce the, uh, the results that we, we see here at the bottom. One thing that I want to note is that the samples or the, res uh, the baseline uh, results seem to be doing an okay job, but they are not that too perfect. And it is uh, actually designed this way to ensure that people actually also would like get an interest in, uh, in competing on this data set directly, because it is motivating that you're actually already able to beat the baseline directly. Um, Finally, I want to uh, summarize the publication that I have done, publications that I've uh, yeah, done during my PhD. The first two papers up here are related to the generative adversarial network that I uh, have used to model uh, plant seedlings with. The two last uh, papers here are related to the data acquisition platform and the description of the data set that I just mentioned. There is a small change to this uh, table here, uh, and that is that the last paper has also been published in the remote sensing now, whereas at the time that I wrote the thesis, uh, it was still only uh, 
had I accepted with a minor revision. So to conclude, the primary objective of my uh, thesis was to explore different methods for increasing the availability of training data for visual recognition systems of plant seedlings. And to do this, I used two different approaches. The first one was to use generative modeling of plant seedlings using GANs, uh, where these models were able to produce uh, distinguishable samples for multiple different plant species while still maintaining a relatively high degree of intraspecies variability in the, uh, in the samples that I produced. And the samples that I produced had also had a relatively high resemblance to the real uh, species they were intended to represent. The second part was that I had developed this uh, new large-scale dataset for visual recognition, which cover a multitude of different species it includes a very high degree of intraspecies variability due to we have both temporal uh, tracking of the plants and have applied different growth conditions that both affect the visual appearance. And uh, this data set is currently the largest publicly available of its kind. So I hope that with these contributions, uh, we would in the future be able to improve upon uh, weed detection and weed classification, uh, improve our weed detection and classification algorithms so that we can uh, deploy these systems uh, to the real world and hopefully also make a reduction in the herbicide usage that we, uh, we have in the current year. That's all. Thank you all for listening. Okay, uh, thank you.